Hey, Brian, can we do yeah. something really cool real fast? Yeah. So I got my uh, my social media girl just happens to be in house right now. Okay. Can we do a uh, can we do a picture together with yeah. me and you side by side? <laughs> yeah. This is Daniela. Hello, Daniela. Hi. Give her a thumbs up. Is it cool? Cool. <laughs> Wait, text it to me. Very cool. Send it off. All right. All right, so uh, I'm Brian Hernandez. I'm here with the one, the only, the great Leo Spaziri of Chicago, Chicago area, right, Leo? Raised in Chicago all my life. All right, so uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about it yourself here? So uh, my name is Leo Spaziri. Uh, I'm a pizzaiolo from Chicago. Uh, like I said, born and raised uh, in Chicago. Uh, I've been in the pizza business all my life. Uh, in some uh, some respect, uh, started you know very young in age. And um, through the years, you know, worked myself up the ladder. Uh, I really, I really have uh, gained, I guess, notoriety. I guess you will say. Um, after about, let's say, maybe 2008, I was the uh, corporate slash executive chef for all the Giordano's restaurants here in Chicago, which you know as the uh, the monster stuffed pizza machine here. Uh, 46 restaurants all over the world. And, uh, great, really great company. Yeah, totally. So uh, yeah, that's where uh, a lot of my uh, you know my my you know, my my knowledge came from as far as uh, talking about high volume restaurants, um, things that are you know uh, again we see today uh, as maybe standard classic things, but uh, as far as procedures go, that sort of thing. But back in the day, you know maybe those weren't uh, you know even known. We weren't even really talking about them back then. So you know it's kind of cool to see the evolution of all that. Well, uh, so you said you've kind of been in it all your life. What's your um? Let's say, what's your first, uh, earliest pizza memory, even from childhood? What, what, maybe the first time you just ever remember the word pizza or the smell? You know, uh, it, it's actually crazy because that's actually what, what my memory is. Um, I grew up uh, in Chicago, street, famous street in, uh, in Chicago is Harlem Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up right on Harlem Avenue in Chicago. And, um, you know, my parents, uh, you know, uh, again, had a, we had a, a three-flat building, uh, very typical for being in the city. Uh, we lived in the middle unit, lived in the basement, and then we used to rent out the uh, the upstairs. But right, uh, literally across Harlem Avenue, there was a um, there was a small pizzeria, and um, I remember in the summertime, you know, the windows being open in the house, and just getting those breezes with the smell of the pizza baking in the neighborhood. And again, that's that's got to be always, and I say it all the time. People mention it. Uh, that's always got to be my number one uh, memory. Uh, that's, it's such a great experience to have that. So flash forward a little bit then, obviously being a part of Chicago, um, uh, pizza is going to be an integral part of growing up, going out with friends afterwards, school, and, you know, just walking down the street. Um, how did you get started in the business? What's your first, uh, what was your first uh, job in the industry? So, you know, again, I mean, there was a, there was a lot of restaurants, you know, as a, you know, growing up, uh, you know, being a young kid, you can't really, you know, jump on a line. A lot of guys wouldn't let you just jump in and start making pizzas. So, a lot of garbage uh, tossing, a lot of mopping floors, a lot of dishwashing, you know, and it's a, you know, it's, you know, I think that's a big piece of this, you know, guys, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends in the industry and when you talk to a lot of guys that are, you know, lifers and, uh, you know, they've been doing this all their life, nobody started out on a line unless their families had a restaurant themselves that they were physically in the kitchens, you know, with the playpen in the back of it. Um, you know, a lot of the guys started out the same way, you know, getting your, uh, you know, your hands wet with, uh, you know, their first experiences, but, you know, taking out garbage the humble way and uh, really, you know, cutting your teeth the, that, that way in there. All right. So you kind of, you, you pretty much muscled your way up the ranks. Did you ever um, own your own pizzeria or did you just kind of uh, work at a management level and others and then up to Giordano's? Yeah, so I never, uh, I, I've never owned my own pizzeria, and it's wow. something that actually comes up all the time. You know, <laughs> being uh, being that I've, uh, you know, I've done all the things that I've done. I've traveled all over the world. I've competed. I've done all these things. And people are just like, "Wow, I can't believe you never had your own restaurant." Why? You know, to me, I always had. Uh, there was always some charm about um, 
uh, working for big operations. I always love that. Um, even with the, you know, my experience at Giordano's, you know, having all those restaurants and, you know, working on consistency and, you know, those were the big, like the nuts and bolts of the operation that really appealed to me. The pizza was always number one, right. but, you know, as soon as you step away from the pizza and actually look, you know, uh, from the outside into an operation and, you know, to be able to see, you know, labor and management and, you know, all these different things in there. Again, my, my, uh, my, the, the big part of the mystique to me was, again, seeing big operations run and making them run consistently. Okay. Well, since you do that end of the um, consulting as well, what do, you, um, what do you think are the hardest hurdles to overcome when someone's trying to start a pizza place? Something you know, that maybe more people against or about? You know, um, about a year ago, I started a website called AskLegalPizza.com. And um, the whole point of me putting the website together, you know, and I don't play computers very well. I'm not uh, computer savvy and all that. So for me to even say that, you know, I was going to start doing a blog and to have a website, you know, it was totally from left field. And, you know, I really had a lot of people help me out to get to that point. But the, the main reason why I wanted to do it was because, um, you know, taking a life's worth of knowledge and to be able to give it to somebody who's either brand new in the pizza business or they're thinking about a career in the pizza business, to be able to share a lot of those things with them, again, to answer your question, those are, those are you know, the biggest hurdles that people have. And to be able to say you have a seasoned guy now that you, know, you can see a red flag coming from a mile away if you're me, you know? But for a brand new guy that you know, now you're talking about, hey, I gotta spend some money on some construction or I gotta buy some equipment, to be able to tell some person, you know, I, I, I think I would do it myself this way instead of that way, and uh, again, a lot of people all of a sudden, when they started getting advice like that from me or seeing that, hey, you know what, Leo's not keeping any secrets. He's giving us recipes. He's doing a lot really that he wants to help us. You can see that genuinely he wants to help us. I think that that's why the website took off. And, you know, even in the consulting world with everything that I'm doing, I really do think that, that you know, people use me as a resource. And it's, uh, it's really humbling to, you know, hear people come back to you after, you know, you're done working on a project with them and say, you know, man, you really, you really changed my life. I would have never been able to do this without you. And I think that ultimately that's the reward. I mean, that's what we're here for, supporting an industry. And, you know, that's, that's really huge for me. So do you, um, what's the, the number one thing that you, you have to consult on that as a consultant that you see people have problem with uh, every time they're opening up? What's the number one problem you have to solve for them? You know what? I, I always, um, you know, I always say this, you know, our business evolves every day, you mm -hmm. know, uh, especially that we're dealing with, you know, uh, products that are still traded as commodities like cheese, you know, and that sort of thing. You know, I always hear people call me up and say, you know, Leo, I, um, I, I don't have, uh, I don't have that much experience. Uh, I got a, um, a distributor that's called me up and now they want to start selling me cheese or they want to start selling me tomatoes. Um, but the problem is, is there's, there's 50 or 20 different kinds of uh, uh, brands out there. How do I know which one is good for me? How do I, you know, how do I get to start? So I think that's probably the number one thing that I get calls on is um, not even before we start making a pizza itself is actually how do I know how to set myself up so that I'm bringing in the right products, the right ingredients, the right equipment, and right. then we can start building a base and, and working from there. That's, uh, again, probably the number one mistake I see people make as well is that they come in, they start a project. They, uh, they get a salesman, you know, who comes in and, uh, you know, offers them the world and, you know, starts selling them certain things. The salesman maybe is looking out for his own back, not for the, uh, the operator themselves. And, you know, ultimately I have seen, unfortunately, a lot of guys get into trouble that way and, or, you know, buying a lot more product than they really need because somebody offered them a, a great deal, if you will, you know? So I think that's, that's probably the number one for me. Yeah. All right. Well, um, just kind of moving right along. I mean, that's a good one too, because that is uh, something that'll get people, like you said, um, they they don't know about their like their build tools or how much they're going to go through yet. And exactly, I think spending more is going to save save money in the long run. Sometimes you just end up eating that cost, uh, you know, literally and figuratively, I guess. <laughs> or throwing in the garbage because it turns into waste because right, you didn't yeah. do it well. Right. So um, what, what is uh, one of your favorite ingredients uh, to get down and, uh, and funky with there when you're making a pie? What's your favorite? You know what? Um, obviously, I'm a dough guy. I've got a reputation as a dough guy. Everybody knows that I eat, breathe, sleep dough. You know, the pizza itself is great, but for me, I consider the dough as, a, as an ingredient, and it's probably your number one ingredient. If the dough's not right, the rest of the pizza's not right. 
Now, if we're talking about toppings, you know, toppings, again, for me, I come from that old school Italian mentality that less is more, you know. So to me, I think that, you know, I do spend a lot of time and attention on the, let's say, the base of my pizza. So like your sauce. Okay. I'm really, I'm really big on, uh, on tomatoes and, you know, the tomatoes that I use in particular are very important to me. So, you know, again, I'm always trying to source something that number one is, you know, very clean label. Um, I like to, I like to be able to control what's in the sauce. So we're talking about tomatoes. I look for a product, you know, when I buy a whole peeled tomato, um, I look for a product that doesn't have any salt in it. It doesn't have any basil in it. It doesn't have any like citric acids or, you know, all these different things that are put into a can to help break down the tomato or to kind of preserve them while they're in that can. So, you know, again, when I start out with a tomato, I have memories as a kid of my dad building these, you know, giant gardens in our backyard in this, you know, spit of uh, land in our city, you know, uh, uh, you know lot. Uh, yeah. in and I remember these tomatoes, it's like, you know, in August, these tomatoes that would come out of the garden were just gorgeous. So for me, it's really important that when we make sauce, when I make a sauce for a pizza, that uh, again, I get those memories of summertime, fresh tasting, you don't have anything better, you know, in there. And again, I like to be able to control what's in the sauce myself. So I don't want any help with it. I don't want it in the can already before I start. All right, purist, I like that. Like you said, uh, you got to start from the bottom up, so... That's right. I guess you start, like you said, with those. So what is one ingredient that you will never use? That, you know, somebody walks in there, you have them escorted out, you know, with extreme prejudice. So I'm, a, I'm big on this, all right? <laughs> Here's the school that I come from, all right? I come from, again, maybe my experience, my background is more on the corporate side of things and seeing big business run, all right? I think this trickles down to the independent operator as well. To me, if a customer is willing to pay for it, I got no problem putting it on a pizza. This goes back to even, and again, I probably get a lot of people that would probably, uh, you know, say some funny things about me for saying this, but even like, you know, the argument about pineapple, like, does anybody really care that somebody put pineapple on a pizza? If that's what your customer likes, put it on there. As long as you're giving them a quality ingredient, what does it matter? So again, for me, yeah. Do I put pineapple on my own pizza? Yeah. If I'm making a pizza for my family, I probably wouldn't put pineapple on it. But again, if somebody's willing to buy it and, they, you know, again, their money is green just like everybody else. Put it on their pizza, sell a pizza, and give them a good experience. You know, that's where I come from. Yeah, I, bet, I kind of thought that's maybe where you were headed on that. But, <laughs> you know, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a good point. I like how you said it. Their money's green like everybody else's. Now, that's I mean, right. that's something that I know other places who are like um, zero customization. And they, and they, it's, you know, it's like, well, how dare you ask me for pineapple? I mean, you – do you see a lot of people like that? Do you, when you consult with them, do you say, look, you know, you can have your standards and stuff, but if somebody wants to pay to add one extra ingredient to this um, pizza, I mean, do, do you try to say that they should, or do you say, you know, stick by your laurels and no customization? I mean, I've seen it both ways and both ways work and both models actually, you know, people are profitable on, on depending on the pizzeria right. and the quality, but, but but here's a big piece of that, all right? If you're opening a pizzeria for the first time or you've got a, you know, you've got an independent operation with one with one location. Yeah. Now, if you've got a list of ingredients that are in-house anyway, and it goes all the way down trickling down the entire menu, so your pasta menu, your salad menu, anything like that. If you've already got an ingredient in-house, it's sitting inside your walk-in cooler on your prep table. Again, if somebody wants green beans on a on a pizza, if it's something that you guys are if you're using anyway in your kitchen, Go ahead, put the green beans on. I don't care. I mean, again, if it's something there. Now, in the same respect, okay, if you think that putting green beans on your pizza is going to, you know, uh, all of a sudden, you know, part the clouds and you're going to hear angels singing. Again, if you're not having any other reason to put green beans in your restaurant, like, except for that pizza, it might be one of those things that I might tell you, hey, you know what, maybe try it as a special before you commit. Don't bring it in just for, you know, one thing. So, again, I think that, again, if, if you're going to come up with a menu – I try to keep everything uh, you know, nice and simple. Keep your line nice and tight. Uh, again, ingredients that you can reuse for other things, to me, are very appealing. So I try to teach people that same thing. If you're going to buy something, if you're, if you're not going to put pineapple on your pizza and you're just going to keep a can of pineapple in the back just in case for a rainy day someone has pineapple, okay, that's great. I, I, it's, it's not a big deal to me. But if you never are going to plan to put pineapple on a pizza, you know, why bring it in? 
So those are, again, that's my school of thought on it. Again, I, you know, I try to, I try to be as simple with people as far as instructing them or basically give them my knowledge. And I think that's, that's probably the biggest point I can make to them. That's great. I mean, that's exactly along the lines of how I think. So it kind of gives me some personal justification there. I, sure. when I argue with these people. I'm like, it's already there in your restaurant. Charge them a, a premium topping price and add it to it. But sure. then that also to answer my other question about, you know, I've been in places where they brought black beans in for one pizza and you open the can, you sell one or two a week and then that can's bad in, in a day. So again, anytime I bring in an ingredient, especially, mm-hmm. you know, if it's something seasonal or, you know, again, there's a lot of things and we can't get them all the time, but all of a sudden, you know, your sales guy walks in the door and says, man, I got a, I got a great deal this week. I got a bunch of this stuff in. Um, it's always nice to be able to throw something on as a special, mm-hmm. uh, People always listen to specials. And again, if you, you know, if it's something that's very good, you'll sell it. But you also got to remember, like, let's say your black bean uh, uh, example. If you only have those black beans on there and you get all of a sudden close to the end of the life, you got to have a backup, a backup plan to be able to say, now, uh, am I going to start mashing these things up and making tacos or something out of them? Like, what else can I make out of them? Because again, it's, it's such a waste. And then at the end of the day, no matter what you saved, you know, because you brought that product in, uh, if it was something special or whatever it might be, all of a sudden to throw it in the garbage, you just lost all your margin. Whatever you made on that, whatever your profit was, now just went away. So again, it's got to be something that you can actually utilize if you do get into a pinch and turn it into something else. All right, perfect. Um, what is ingredient one ingredient that you don't use now but wish you could or maybe have never messed with or you know, something that you, you don't get to play around enough with. What's kind of like your dream ingredient that you don't have your hands on too much? You know, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big guy on uh, talking about doughs again. You know, I love to, I love to make doughs. I, I got a lot of, you know, fermentation that I have, you know, that happens, you know, in doughs. And I really try to, uh, to really, you know, push the limits, you know, of, of what can be done with dough. And there's a lot of times that, you know, I've seen uh, certain ingredients, for example, um, that I know that I've worked with in Italy that, for example, I can't get here in the States. So I'm either trying to source it, to get it on the boat, to get it here uh, mm-hmm. to Chicago, or, you know, see if somebody can send me a little bit. But, you know, there's things like even uh, uh, personally, there's this one really, uh, this, this malt. I like to put some malt occasionally into my dough. There's this one particular malt that I can only get in Italy. And if I try to get it here, I can't get it. But, you know, the good part is that, uh, you know, having experience with that particular type of ingredient, I can source local companies here in the States where they maybe don't have that particular ingredient that I'm looking for, but I can turn around to a company, uh, let's say we're talking malt. I can turn around to a company like my friends at uh, Red Star Yeast and mm-hmm. say, hey, you know what? I've got a bakery application. I'm working with malt for pizza. Um, what do you have for me? And then all of a sudden they could give me some other stuff that might pertain to the bread world which is where the other half of my background goes. I was an artisan baker for a really long time and I have a lot of experience in artisan bread. So a lot of those things that I was able to play around with on the bread side, you know, how do they uh, transpose over onto the, uh, the pizza side? And again, you know, that's a, another cool thing of being able to do what I do. So uh, an ingredient like malt, even though it's not that one that I really, really like from Italy, I'm able to find an alternative here uh, in the States. Awesome. That's I like how you go back to the base again, and that's I don't think I'll ever get that answer from anybody else except maybe Tom Lehman or Peter Reinhardt. Yeah. Guys. Um, so yeah, I just, I love those guys. Yeah, Peter uh, Reinhardt's a great guy. He, if you talk to him, he probably might even tell you that I might have a man crush on him. Nah. He's, uh, <laughs> he's been a mentor for a really long time, and uh, I, I never forget the first meeting that I had with Peter Reinhardt. It was uh, uh, actually a conference call that I had with him through Forno Bravo. And um, they uh, they got him on the phone, and all of a sudden, I was like a like a little schoolgirl. I couldn't even talk. I was all tongue tied. Like I had I couldn't remember anything about baking, about bread, about dough. Like I was stuttering the whole thing. It was so funny. But he's such a great guy. Peter's such an awesome guy. Yeah, I think John Arena is my man crush in here, just because. <laughs> John Arena is another really cool guy, man. He's yeah, a, he's he a taught cool me a lot, and he's so free with his knowledge. It's insane. Yeah. I said, you sure you don't mind us putting this dough recipe up there? He's like, yeah, I, I probably stole it from somebody else. So he <laughs> you likes to get it out there. A lot of these guys that you're talking about, we all speak the same language. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, when we start speaking that same language, the outsider looking in might be left scratching their head saying, what are these guys really talking about? 
And a guy like John Arena, for example, or Tom Lehman, you know, these guys have always been very free by saying, hey, you know what? I'll give you whatever you need. You want to talk about Dole? Let me tell you about Dole. And I, I really took a lot of that to heart, you know, and even with Peter Reinhardt, you know, uh, I, I must have watched. I know Joe, I've got to have watched his TED on sourdough bread at least 100 times. Right. Because every time I watch it, I hear something different or I find something that I missed. And to be able to turn around and tell people again that, hey, you know what, non-biased, this is the way I do it or this is the way I like to do it or you're doing it this way. Why don't you try it another way and I might be able to give you a better result. Again, all of a sudden, the world just opens up for you because, you know, people are, are non-threatened that way. John Arena, he's another guy. You can walk up to him, ask him anything you ever want to know. And he'll tell you just like yours, uh, you know, brother, whatever. Come over here, let me show it to you. You know, so that's really cool to have. And he's another guy that I really, I really respect in our industry for that. Well, and, and since you don't particularly have a, um, a a shop, you know, so you don't have like competitors on that respect. Um, but did you take kind of that attitude from these guys who are so giving of the knowledge? Is that kind of what geared you towards this consulting thing, to where you say, "Hey, look, I want you, everybody to do it, and I want them all to do it right, and I want everybody to have a fair shake." Did you grab it from them, or is it something well, you always you know, Actually, it was um, you know back in the day, you know, in Chicago. I mean, our 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 restaurant scene, you know, our pizza scene. I mean. It was, you know, back in the day, it was really rough out here. Uh, you know, Anthony Bourdain had a great, uh, a great quote in his uh, Kitchen Confidential book where he said, you know, back in the day, you know, guys that were in the restaurant business, anybody who was a cook, they were either a criminal or a drug addict, you know? So again, growing up in that, knowing that, hey, these guys that, you know, are supposed to be my mentors, you have that mentality that, again, it's very tough, very uh, secretive. You know, I, I know this because I did it myself, you know, go learn it from somebody else. So when I was coming up through the ranks, I used to keep everything tight-lipped, man. And, and I was very careful about who I told things to or shared dough recipes with. And it wasn't really until about maybe 2008, 2009 when, uh, when I met Tony Gemignani for the first time. And Tony was one of those guys who really said, hey, you know what? You might be a really good pizza guy in Chicago, but there's a whole world out there that you haven't even experienced. And it wasn't until uh, I was in one, I think it was in Tony's maybe second ever uh, pizza class that he did. And, you know, uh, uh, that's where I got to meet uh, Graziano Bertuzzo from, uh, uh, from, uh, from Italy. And, you know, all the guys that came over here to support Tony when he opened his school. It was really Tony that was the first person who said, yeah, you know what, all these things that you think are secrets, we've known them forever. You know, it's not a secret. So really, what are, you, what, are you, what are you holding back for? Why, why, why not give back a little bit more or why not talk to people a little bit more and see what everybody else is doing? So all of a sudden, you got a guy like Jim Mignani who now at that time, back in 2008, you know, again, we knew about him in the pizza world, but all of a sudden you turn on Jay Leno and he's on TV or you see him on, you know, all these different programs. It's like, man, this guy's got to be doing something right. And it wasn't until I actually went to California and San Francisco and, um, you know, at that time he was in a town called Manteca and uh, he was still teamed up with his brother at Paisano's and we go in there and you actually see Tony grinding it out on a line and, uh, you know, seeing that thing and him saying, hey, come back here in my kitchen. I want to show you something. This is how I do New York pizza. For me, a guy from California talking about New York pizza, that floored me, you know. So again, it wasn't until I started getting those experiences. And then, you know, Tony was actually the guy who helped me um, um, get into the Scuola Italiana Pizzaioli, where I actually went to Italy and I started training in Italy. And that's when I went even deeper down the rabbit hole with Graziano Bertuzzo. And all of a sudden, all these little things that, you know, where I thought I was at this really high level and, you know, man, I'm the Chicago pizza guy. All of a sudden, I really got knocked down the pegs, you know, and I really said, man, I really don't know anything. And I really have to open my eyes. So it was taking that and seeing all these other guys in our industry, um, you know, meeting John Arena for the first time or meeting, you know, a guy like Tom Lehman, the, 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 the dough doctor, you know, saying, man, I thought I was the dough doctor. And I remember telling them, I, I told Tom Lehman one time, this is a pizza expo many years ago, Tom, listen, whenever you retire, I want to, I, I want you to actually hand over the title of dough doctor to me, you know, and we still talk about that all the time. We have a good laugh, whatever, but again, you know, these guys have such a great reputation that, you know, the, that integrity in the business, they're, they're, they're masters at what they do because of that, you know, trying to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, non, non-competitive with, uh, with people and just talking openly and freely. 
it's it's huge and supporting our industry like this is huge for all of us sounds great yeah that's and that's the thing is it's, it's just pizza so i like the attitude they all have it's like it's not a secret are you going to hold it secret because then maybe you're not going to learn other stuff that could actually help you it's really cool to see you know the evolution and where we've come today but Again, you know, I, I, I'm on the same page that, you know, we should, we should be supporting our industry. And if I've got some knowledge that somebody else could use, I think I should be able to open up and be free in, with that knowledge. All right. So let's get into this. Um, what recipe uh, are you presenting to uh, the PMQ recipe, whatever we're calling this segment? <laughs> The biggest thing when uh, when uh, when I got asked to put this recipe together, we know that it's going to be coming out in November, uh, you know, with the fall and everything right around the corner. I really wanted to focus on some of those ingredients. Um, so what I did was um, butternut squash, where I roasted it off inside of the wood-fired oven. Mm -hmm. And then once I started talking about butternut squash as, the, uh, as let's say, the main ingredient for this pizza, uh, I started thinking about all the other things that went along in fall. And a lot of times you always see the same thing. Butternut squash, you always got to, you know, it, it, people treat it like another ingredient, almost like pumpkin. So, you know, do I put nutmeg in there? Is there cinnamon in there? Is it sweet? I really wanted to get away from the sweet side of butternut squash and do something savory. So what I did was I had the idea what will cut the natural sweetness of the butternut squash. And um, I decided to use some poblano peppers. What I did was um, almost just like I roast a, a, a red pepper inside of my wood-fired oven, I, I fire roasted the poblano in there along with the butternut squash. So once I had those out, I peeled them off and, uh, you know, I kind of, you know, sliced them up a little Julian style. And uh, I felt that the poblano pepper has a little bit of heat to it. It's a little bit smoky, you know, naturally. And I thought it was a great contrast for that butternut squash, which now I wanted savory. I didn't want a sweet base to this, all right? So from there, what goes along with the poblano? You know, I started thinking bacon. Well, let's get away from bacon. I wanted something a little bit more del delicate. So what I did was I went to uh, my, my favorite salumi guy here in Chicago, and uh, I got some uh, smoked pancetta. Uh, smoked pancetta is uh, cured uh, bacon, if you will, pork belly that's rolled up cured. And uh, again, this one is smoked, naturally smoked. I had them do some very paper thin uh, slices of pancetta, which normally whenever you talk about pancetta, everybody gets it, you know, and they're all talking about uh, getting, you know, quarter inch thick, they're dicing it up, they're rendering off the fat and using it as little bacon bits. I wanted to go totally opposite. So what I did was I had them do it paper thin, almost like prosciutto. On the pizza itself, I put some uh, pancetta, some of the smoked pancetta raw, we call it crudo, you know, in, in Italian. Right. So I had, I had the raw pancetta that's very thinly sliced that's going to render some of that fat onto the pizza. I had the poblano peppers. I've got the butternut squash. What I did when I, when I made the, the actual uh, puree, I didn't puree it with a machine. I actually took a bean masher or you can do, uh, you know, a masher like you're going to do uh, potatoes, like a potato masher. Yeah. Yeah. I did with that, cut it with some um, uh, mascarpone. I got this awesome um, uh, mascarpone from Galbani. Galbani cheese, you know, everybody knows those guys. They have some really awesome products. I used the, um, the Italian mascarpone. They call, Galbani calls it mascarpone autentico, all right? That one is, uh, it gives a real nice richness. And when it's, when it's cut into that um, uh, roasted butternut squash, uh, I made this really beautiful, smooth, creamy puree, okay? Again, I was trying to get away from pump, canned pumpkin that looked like uh, the stuff you have on your pumpkin pie, you know? Yeah. On top of that, now I got the poblano pepper. I've got this, uh, this smoked pancetta that's raw going on top of the pizza. And then finishing it, I, did, um, I didn't want to use a heavy mozzarella on this. I figure now I spent so much time creating all these different layers of flavor. Uh, I felt that uh, mozzarella on top of this pizza would just mask everything. So what I did was I used um, some feta, and I used the product through uh, Presi the, the President brand. Uh, President, um, they call it's a brand new product called uh, uh, Valbreso, uh, Valbreso, V E A L B R E S O. It's a it's a French feta made with 100% sheep's milk. So now the idea of using that feta, I've got a little bit so of that saltiness from the feta cheese, but French feta is a little bit lighter. It's not, uh, it's, it's not as uh, pronounced as like the Greek feta, if you will, for example. Mm -hmm. So again, I got that saltiness now of that cheese. 
I've got the the pancetta with the smokiness. I got the poblano. It's got some heat and some smoky, and the creaminess of that um, uh, butternut squash. All of a sudden, I felt that I had a lot of contrast, but I had a lot of great layers. I baked it off in my wood-fired oven, and then one last layer, I got these imported amaretti cookies. Uh, amaretti cookies are like uh, Italian, uh, let's say, macaroons, if you will. Yeah. What I did was I took those uh, those cookies and I crumbled them up just by hand over the top of the pizza. So that's now the sweet note. Instead of putting that nutmeg or that cinnamon inside of the puree of uh, butternut squash, now I had a texture that's crispy, crunchy on top, that amaretto note, folded in with everything else, uh, all of a sudden, I think this is a fantastic, we ate about six of them last night. So, Did you really? Uh, wow. It was very well received last night, <laughs> and I think uh, the viewers of uh, the magazine are really going to love this recipe. For me, this this pizza totally spoke fall to me. The poblano pepper is maybe, you know, a curveball all the way out from left field, but again, incorporated with the rest of these savory ingredients, it works very well, mm. and then you sweetness that comes from those amaretti cookies in contrast with the heat and uh, the smokiness of the poblano it just works trust me it works <laughs> oh, it looks like it does um and that's what i was wondering i'm like did you put croutons on that what the hell <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> no, that, no that works because like you said it's more that texture too and this is all after so it's still going to be firm and crunchy and it's got that sweet that like you said you look at it you expect butternut squash people are going to be like oh sweet no it's, it's not, not going to be that it'll have it for you but that's not it the focus. Got, it's got this beautiful creaminess to it. Like I said, the base just really, it goes along. Everything pairs and complements themselves on that pizza really nicely. As a consultant, how often do you create new recipes? Or is it just when the guy like me comes out and says, hey, Leo, I need a recipe? I've got a library of notebooks that I've probably collected over the past 10, 12 years. And um, what I do with, uh, with recipes, again, you know, what I make one day might change the very next day. Not just changing ambient uh, conditions change, seasons change, ovens change, all these different things change. So for me, um, even though I turn around and I say, listen, Brian, I'm going to give you a dough formula. Let's use dough as an example. I can give you any dough formula in the world that you want, but unless you know the process of how to actually make that dough, you can have any dough, but if the, if the process isn't right, it's not going to turn out. Same thing when a customer comes to me, uh, I have to have to, a blank slate each time. Okay. So even though I might have, you know, my favorite dough formulas or my favorite recipes, you come into me and say, Leo, I want you to develop something for me. I'm going to find out, okay, what kind of oven do you have? Where do you live? What's around you? How does it bake? This sort of thing. And again, I got, if I do my job correctly, my job is to get inside of your head, put your vision on a plate, right? So that being said, if it's a matter of saying, Leo, I like my pizza a little bit crunch, uh, crispier, crunchier, that sort of thing. I like my, my, my dough sheeted out paper thin. I don't like a raised edge. I like a flat edge. Um, you know, again, all these different things play into the final recipe. So again, even though we start out with a base, if you come to my house and I make a dough formula for you, um, you might taste it and say, yeah, this is pretty good, but I would like, uh, I like the, the dough to be a little crispier. Well, now all of a sudden we're going to start fine tuning it and we're going to make something specific to you. So recipes, I guarantee I've got thousands in all these notebooks over the years. But is it going to be something that you're going to use for yourself? You'll probably end up changing it at some point and making something that's custom for yourself. Well, and how involved do you actually get in like menu creation? Do you, do you just help them kind of fine tune the, the basics such as your doughs and your sauces? Or do you actually... Can you do delve into, you know, I want to give you, I'm going to work with you and get you five signature pies and pass that you're on your own. Cause I mean, five is a good number to start with, but yeah, for sure. But when I, when I get a call and especially if it's uh, something where they're asking me to come in and actually consult the restaurant, the entire body of work, not mm -hmm. just the pizza. Right. Um, I do pastas, I do bread, I do salads, I can do desserts, I can do everything. So really when it comes down to it, it's a matter of you saying, Leo, you know what? I want to put together my, uh, my menu. I only want, uh, let's say, three salads on there. I want maybe three or four appetizers. I want, uh, you know, a, a core of pizzas that are going to have something for everybody. Maybe a pasta. If they got a finished kitchen, they want pasta. Okay, let's do that. Or a uh, dessert. So, again, at this point, when I'm walking in and I'm doing that, it's a matter of now coming in, seeing the vibe of the restaurant, seeing the vibe of the owner and what they're giving back. 
and, uh, and, and ultimately helping them come up with something where I can use all my past experiences, all my travels throughout the world and say, hey, have you ever seen this or have you ever done this? Let's do something totally different than your neighbor is doing and let's do this, you know? Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, building up that excitement, I might have one vision, walk away. The next day, I'll get a call and say, hey, Leo, you sparked my interest in this. Hey, we do it this way. And again, once you build up that rapport and that, that open conversation, the menu is really just flows. You know, it's, it's really nice to put a menu together uh, working like that. Right. How, how did you get into consulting? When was the first time somebody asked you something and you gave a good answer and you're like, damn it, this is what I want to do? You know, um, it, was, uh, it was at the point when I came back from Italy after I went to tra- when I trained. It was like about 2009 at that point. I came back from Italy with all this new knowledge of things that I'd never seen before, never tried before. And um, when I got back, uh, when I got back from Italy, I had sparked a lot of media attention in Chicago uh, mm. locally because I went away and I went to this pizza school, which at that time, who was talking about going to pizza school, you know? So it created this storm in the corporate office at Giordano's to finally get to the point where I says, you know what? Uh, you know, they said, put a non-compete in front of me and all this different paperwork, you know, showing that, you know, hey, what you're doing is uh, is not along with our philosophy and uh, we want to stop you from doing it. And I'm like, man, I just scratched the sur- surface on something. You guys have been around for 50 years. I haven't. And I want to continue doing this. So that was right at the same week I, uh, I left Giordano's. I walked away and now I didn't have a job. I didn't have a plan. And then you know, the world works in weird ways, man. All of a sudden my phone rings and, um, Hey, I got a project that I'm working on. You want to come take a look at this pizza I'm doing. And that really is what opened the door. It was that first phone call of me not even knowing that I was going to do a consulting uh, job and saying, yeah, I'll come give you some advice. Let me come check it out. And, uh, walking in this pizzeria and saying, wow, I'm seeing so many mistakes here. I'm seeing so many things that you can do better. There's so much bleeding here. And, uh, you know, that was back in the day when the bubble bursted in the, in the, uh, the housing market. Mm. And all of a sudden, you know, all the low-hanging fruit disappeared. So now you had these restaurant owners who were calling me. I started getting this reputation as, hey, here's a pizza guy who knows the restaurant business. Why don't we have him come in and take a look? So I started doing these calls. People started coming up to me and saying, you know, I'm, I'm losing all this money. I can't afford to stay in business anymore. And kind of like Gordon Ramsay style, walk into a place, line up the crew and say, who's here? Where's, why am I seeing a manager, not a, an owner? If you've got bleeding, why are you spending 50, 60 grand a year on a, on a restaurant manager? Why don't you go back to what made you successful? Come back to work every day, you know, get rid of the manager, that sort of thing. And that's really when, uh, but, it, but again, if you remember back in 2008, 2009, yeah. all of a sudden, it, was, it wasn't just little changes that were happening. People stopped eating out. You know, people started really watching their pennies. It was so tight and it really affected our industry back there and th- back then. And that's really what opened my eyes to say, look, I've, I'm starting to get all these people now that are crying that they're losing all this money. There's no employees. They can't do this. They can't do that. They can't afford to pay people. All of a sudden it's like, let's fine tune this. Wow. Look at how much money you're wasting on ingredients. Look at how much waste you have. You even know what your food cost is. Talking to people about food costs and they're scratching their head at like, what are you even asking me? It really, like I said, opened my eyes and say, hey, you know what? There's a hole in the market here right now. And if I can share some of this mar- this, this information or knowledge with these people, um, you know, again, it's going to help them save their business. And I did that for about eight years um, where, you know, during, uh, during that time that I was, uh, that I was doing this, um, I was taking on other jobs here and there, you know, and, uh, you know, I had one, I was working with a, a large Italian restaurant chain here in Chicago, uh, where they asked me, Hey, you know, come in and be our corporate pizza guy for our chain, 26 restaurants and, um, you know, come in and do that. And all of a sudden I was, uh, I went from a consultant to say, Hey, you know, where I'm, uh, you know, be week to week to, Hey, you mind signing a, a year contract with us? We want you to stay on board and really get to know the, uh, the ins and outs of our company and help us make some major changes. So all of a sudden it was like, I never was looking for work anymore. It was just like the phone kept ringing and I was always working on the next opportunity. And that's really what got to me to the point where, you know, I am today and, you know, trying to help people out. So consulting is one of those things I never thought I would be a consultant. It kind of just fell in my lap and I figured out that, you know, people are, uh, you know, appreciating what I'm doing and I'm pretty good at it. And I, I ran with it. 
That first guy that called you after you just quit your Donalds, did you charge him or did you just like, shoot, I'll do a favor? So back in the day, it was like, I didn't even know I could charge people. You know? So you just they went over to help. Yeah, I'll come over, I'll come give you a hand. I'll come help. You need me to jump on the line while I'm here? Like, you know, and then we end up working eight hours in the joint, you know? It's like, but, you know, again, it, it, at that time, you know, this is all stuff that, you know, uh, kind of like, you know, again, that, that whole Geminiani thing. These are some of the things that Tony told me. Like, hey, you know what? There is no more secrets, you know? Like, yeah, you're a pizza guy. If you've got some knowledge that you can help somebody else, share it. And it kind of just, like I said, it just played into that whole thing so naturally. That's great. Um, so who do you usually consult? Do you, um, what's the gamut of people that you consult for? Is it usually just a beginner, somebody jumping in, or do you have experts that come to you and say, look, man, I'm tanking and I don't know why, what am I doing wrong? So, you know, when it started out, it was a lot of independence, people from the neighborhood that I knew, people that I've had, you know, some contact with at some point. Um, those were the kinds of calls that I would get, that I was getting. As word started getting out about what I was doing, again, at that time, you know, thinking back, you know, 08, there, there wasn't a lot, like the buzz in the pizza world that we're seeing today wasn't here back then. You know, yeah, PMQ had a magazine. Pizza Today had a magazine. We knew that there were certain things going on in the world. But, you know, if you didn't physically have that magazine in your hand, there was still an entire sector of the world that we weren't even touching, that nobody was even looking in our direction at that time. You know, so when I started really, my name started getting out there. That's when all of a sudden I started having a lot of these corporate guys call me, you know, and one of the things I think that I really conveyed back then, and I still convey now to this day is that everything is confidential. If you're going to share your dough recipe with me that I, that you've been working on for 20 years, 30 years, who am I to, to give that information out? So I was always up front with these people that whatever we talk about, we'll stay in our four walls, you'll stay between us, and I'm going to help you improve to the point where you got it down pat. That led me up to the point where I started seeing, I mean, I'm talking national major corporations coming up and saying, Leo, we need help with dope. Really? Working on this. Um, can you help us? And I would invite them all over to Chicago, even to this day. I've got my headquarters in my backyard. You know, I got my little pizza test kitchen back there. It's back there for a reason. It's safe. It's secure. There's four walls. Nobody would ever think that, you know, you've got, you know, people who are involved in, you know, uh, multi-million dollar corporations in the pizza world that would fly out to Chicago to sit in this little two-car garage in my backyard. And I'll tell you what, man, someday if you ever come out, I would love to have you out and check it out. But if those walls would talk, could talk, you know, the, the deals that were made in that kitchen, the, the, the projects that were worked on in there, I mean, it's just amazing to see, you know, the, the amount of stuff. So, you know, as, I, as we talk about consulting, I really try to open myself up to whoever wants it. Uh, it could be the brand new independent. I mean, on my website, I've got a real-time chat button that you can go on there at any time and send a, a message to my iPhone. And just like we're texting, I get guys from Brazil, Toronto. I had a guy from, I had people from Puerto Rico come into my backyard and, uh, and, and work on dough formulas. So, you know, to be able to support somebody and say, hey, you got a quick question about cheese, you got a question about sausage, here, this is my thought on it. And then, you know, thank you. And you never hear from them again. Or, you know, six months down the line, you go to a trade show and they come up, hey, Leo, I'm so-and-so. I had that, that cheese or sausage question. Thank you so much for your help. You know, and it's like, oh, cool, I finally get to meet you, you know. Um, so again, there is really no boundary to it. And I think that's the big thing with, you know, with pizza, there is no boundaries. We try to, we try to keep it, you know, uh, not as general as possible, but we try not to put a limitation or a wall up because you never know what the next guy is going to, you know, what's going to pop into their head based on something that you told them. And again, it might a lot, you know, make them push the envelope. And, uh, again, it might be something that's great in the future for all of us, you know? So I think that's really important. It's that give back to get back eventually. I mean, you can't. That's right. Everything that's right. If you want something to come back at you eventually, sometimes you might need the help. So, That's right. I Absolutely. I love that. All right. Well, the rest of these questions I think we've actually answered. So let's just go back into um, how did you get all these affiliations that you have, uh, Stagioni and so on. I mean, if you look at your Facebook, there's a pretty impressive list over there. Um, so, so I mean, let's start with like Stagioni. I mean, what do you – when did you meet them? What did you do for them or do do with them currently? So Cinque Stagioni is actually a really special one to me. And um, 
it's one of those relationships that I got from actually not trying to build a relationship at all. It actually started a friendship, you know? Um, when I went to my first pizza class with Tony Gemignani, um, uh, Tony had uh, which he's a part of, come to the States and they actually gave him uh, the first school in the U.S., in California. And with that, they brought out all their products. They brought everybody out with them. So that's when I got my first hands into La Cinquesta Joni Flower. Again, this is being like 08, 09. So um, I got the chance at Tony's school to meet a guy named Ricardo Agujaro, who owns the mill. He's like a fifth generation owner. And there's something about Ricardo that, you know, people who know him, first of all, he's the, the biggest, tallest Italian you've ever seen in your whole life. So when I stand next to Ricardo, I'm actually up to about his belly button. And I could joke about it all the time. I'm so short. But all of a sudden, you know, he's like, you know, here's an Italian guy that went to, you know, finishing school. He went to college at UCLA. He's a surfer. You know, he lives in Venice. You know, he's in the water all the time. So I hit it off really good with him because of our personal friendship. And then at that time, when I was saying, look, I'm going to go back, uh, you know, Tony suggested I go back to Italy and, um, you know, I start getting more in-depth training and all the different styles, you know, and you know, we talk about, you know, being a master. There's so many guys who have this claim of being a master pizzaiolo or master pizza maker, but all of a sudden, well, how did you get that title? Did you just give it to yourself or did somebody actually like, here, you know, <laughs> you get the queen giving you the sword, like here, it's yours now, you know, like. But, you know, so, you know, Ricardo was one of those guys that said, hey, you know, come to Italy and I'm going to show you some cool stuff. And I went to school in Venice. You know, I got to hang out a lot, really hang out one on one with Graziano. And at that point, Ricardo said, I want to show you the mill. So we went to the mill. You know, he's able to speak English. I was speaking Italian also. You know, the classes out there are all in Italian. So, you know, I finished the courses in Italian. But once I actually started walking around the mill and he's, you know, he felt like, Hey, this guy's got passion for flour. He's got passion. He wants to actually get under the truck and watch the grain come out of the truck, going into the hopper to go feed into the mill so we can grind it. I think that all of a sudden he realized that and said, you know, I really don't have anybody in the U S that can kind of give me technical support. I've got all these people calling in you know, we're limited to who's speaking English. I'm limited to the people who can support the people from the U.S. And at that time, he didn't have very much flour coming into the States. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I actually saw the mill that I said, you know, that I saw that, hey, this guy doesn't just have one type of flour. He's got a full line of baking stuff. The, the, the Cinque Stagioni brand started out as a, um, a pastry flour with a brand called La Sinfonia. And they've got so many different brands under that Agujado Fino, uh, Fina label, that umbrella. Mm -hmm. Chiquistoni is one of them. So at that point, I was in Venice. Um, you know, I saw this great stuff. I came back to the States, and Ricardo calls me up one day and says, Hey, Leo, would you mind if, um, if I start sending you some, you know, some technical referrals? Guys calling us up that are looking for help in the States. You're doing some consulting work now. We're hearing about what you're doing. Would you mind fielding, fielding some questions and talking dough? And that's really where our relationship went. You know, back in the day, this is back in 2008, 2009, I started competing. Uh, Tony Gemignani was actually the first one that really uh, got me to the point where I called up, uh, you know, I was going to compete in Vegas and uh, I was going to make a Chicago stuffed pizza. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they told me at that time that uh, I had to bake in the uh, the non uh, the, the the non traditional category because my Chicago pizza wasn't traditional at that time. Well, you know, I was talking to guys and saying, "Well, screw that, man! Why am I not traditional? Because I bake mine; it's two inches high, and I'm baking it in the oven for a half an hour. You know, like why is it not traditional?" Yeah. And um, you know, it's a lot different today. And I think that again, talking about the boundaries, really opened up a lot of of, of things. You know, then. So I made my pizza and, you know, Tony was one of those guys saying, man, you got such a cool story. You know, I would love you to join my team and I want you to come to Italy and compete. Well, we're in Vegas and he tells me, he says, look, so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you this straight out as quick as I can. The Italians are going to hate this. Just so you know, they're going to hate it. But for you, it's more about building that attention to Chicago style pizza and getting it known as a style. So back then, when I went to Italy with this pizza, you know, the pan pizza division in Italy was most guys doing uh, like a Sicilian style pan pizza 
where it maybe, maybe was an inch high. And, you know, you've got, you know, like a half sheet uh, pizza as what their traditional pizza was looking like. Here, all of a sudden, I come and I got this, you know, they called it cheesecake. I got a picture. I got to see if I can find it. I'll send it to you. I got a pizza where there's three judges looking at a pizza that's this thick on a plate and all three of them at the same time looking at this thing and picking it apart with a fork, trying to figure out, man, there's got to be three kilos of cheese in this pizza, you know? Like, and that's, that was one of the coolest things, you know, back then. I know I'm digressing, but like... Well, no, no. So you took a Chicago style. Was it like Giordano Chicago style or like the I Chicago... Did, I, did, I did a Chicago stuffed pizza. Stuffed and, um, pizza. I did in, stuffed in pizza. In Italy. In Italy. And uh, it was... It was on you, man. But I wasn't... <laughs> But here's the deal. I didn't find out until after I was telling everybody that that was the first guy to ever do it in a competition. I actually found out in Wisconsin at that time, there's another girl who at that time, her name was uh, uh, Jackie, and I'm going to butcher her name, Register or Register. She's actually married to Sean Browser now. Um, (laughs) Jackie, actually, the year before, had made her Chicago stuffed pizza in Italy the year before I did. It wasn't until because I was working for Giordano's that I, you know, I got all this recognition I made. They were talking about it in the paper, but uh, Jackie actually was the first person. No, to do it. I was the second, but and it was such a cool thing back then, you know, to be able to go there. I came in. I'm not joking, Brian. I came in dead last place. The pizza <laughs> came in beautiful. If I would have made that pizza here in Chicago, I would have been. I had a hundred people standing in line to try it. I came in last place. They hated it, man. But Gemignani at, at Pizza Expo, I'll never forget, he came up to me and says, hey, Leo, I'm just going to tell you right now, we're going to take you out. You're going to be on a team. You're going to do this stuff with us. But don't expect very high hopes, you know. Just go in there. Do, make your best pizza that you can. Have fun, you know. But for you, it's more about that recognition now that people are going to start understanding the Chicago pizza as a style, you know. And, uh, you know, again, playing into that with what, you know, what I was doing with, uh, with the flour mill, now all of a sudden I had a guy a guy who has his own mill that basically a kid in a candy store, I got access to any flower that I want now. Right. So here I am, 2008, who's talking about double zero flower at that time besides maybe Tony Gemignani, you know? And what I'm asking him is, hey, can I, uh, can I increase the hydration on this typical Italian, uh, this typical Chicago style pizza that's run through a sheeter? Can I stretch the dough any different? Now I'm talking about putting a cell structure into Chicago pizza, you know, which normally has basically a a flaky biscuit type crust, you know, with a lot of butter and that sort of thing in it. So again, pushing the envelope, what can I do? Called up Ricardo and he says, you know, Leo, people hated that pizza. I can't believe you're even playing around with this thing still. And I'm like, yeah, but listen, we're going to do something great. All of a sudden playing around with different grinds of flour. We weren't talking about double zero uh, flour anymore. Now we're talking about maybe more stone ground. I've got better absorption properties. The dough is a little bit different. And better, uh, we talk about digestibility, you know. So you eat a piece of Chicago pizza, that stuffed pizza, you feel like you ate a brick, man. I mean, it's heavy. So all of a sudden, if I can make that crust a little bit lighter, if I can knock some of the toppings out of there so I don't have six pounds of cheese in this pizza, is there a way I can, I can stretch it out differently? Again, these are all the things that now where we're hearing people do Chicago-style pizza all over the world, you know. Uh, I hate to say that I, I, I carried that on my shoulders and like, you know, you see the McDonald's uh, golden arches, you know, and you always know that that's McDonald's. Unfortunately, at that time, everybody that would see me recognized me as the Chicago style pizza guy. And I really spent a lot of time trying to get away from that. Not that I hate the style, not that I don't do it regularly, but again, I was trying not to be corralled into that. And that's why, you know, even locally, you know, I got like such great friends out here, like the Gino Regos of the world and Lenny Rago and Bruno Brunetti, you know, all these guys, Tony Troiano here. There's so many awesome pizza guys that are around me. And it really wasn't until recently that I started meeting some of these guys. Gino and I know each other for maybe a couple of years. But if you see us together, we're like two brothers, man, who have been fighting in the alley, you know, all our lives, you know, like. He's such a cool guy and we have so much in common that, you know, it's such a cool thing to have that, you know, a guy like that in my backyard that I can fire things off of. Um, you know, even Gino, he's got the Via Pizzeria brand. I mean, what a cool story he's got just with that, you know. Yeah. Winning competitions, walking in with a mix and saying, that I'm, I'm, winning, I'm winning national competitions with a, a mix that we made that anybody could use at home. Make a yeah. pizza just like I make it out of your home kitchen. Like, 
he's such a great story. He's such a great guy, very humble. I mean, salt of the earth. I mean, what you see is what you get with Gino. Lenny's the same way. Bruno especially, man. Like, you know, we grew up in the same neighborhood. Uh, Bruno's family had restaurants. I mean, you know, all that. Like, again, just to be able to see these guys and get that attention uh, or get their attention, I mean, I never would have had that before, let's say, 2008. Right. No. Really cool. Really cool. What about like, becoming brand ambassador at, at Forno Bravo? How did that happen? Just uh, using their ovens while you're making so, – you any those? So, actually, the Forno Bravo thing was kind of crazy because um, the uh, there was one year it was uh, I competed at Pizza Expo, mm -hmm. and um, I got approached by one of their marketing people. Came up to me and said, Leo, we know a lot about you. Like, almost like, you know, they, they, not that they stalked me, but the guy really knew who I was, really knew my background. And says, um, I'm from Forno Bravo. There's a lot of other oven companies out there. But if you've got about 15, 20 minutes, I'd like to call you after the show. And I'd like to tell you what we do. Again, seeing Forno Bravo, the way they operate. Forno Bravo didn't start out as a commercial oven company. Forno Bravo started out by making residential ovens. So again, thinking back where I came from, these are people who are passionate about making pizza. They want to make a pizza at home. They want to make it in their backyard. We're talking about cooking with fire. It's a primal technique. All of a sudden seeing, hey, Forno Bravo is not the biggest company out there. And actually, you barely ever even hear about them at that point. So all of a sudden, you know, everybody was over here, you know, we're talking about all these different brands of wood-fired ovens, and nobody's really talking about this one. This was made in the USA. This one sounds pretty cool. Let me go see what this is about. All of a sudden, I start seeing how they produce the ovens, who the people are in the office, customer service-wise. There wasn't, you know, 100 people working in this company. There was a dozen people, you know? Mm. Seeing that, you know, the owner of the company and the COO are actually in the trenches, you know, working on production schedules, walking through the production floor, giving ideas on, on you know, how we can improve their oven, all of a sudden they come to me and say, hey, Leo, you know what? We're, we're a residential oven company. We've got a commercial line of ovens now that we're pushing out there. But you would think that for a pizza company, we'd have some people that make pizzas working for us. So we want, we want you to entertain coming on as our pizza guy. So again, it, was, it wasn't that I was going on and saying I was going to be the brand ambassador for Forno Bravo Ovens. It was like, hey, Leo, come and kick the tires around. And let us know what you think about our oven. As a pizza guy. As a pizza guy. Again, not threatening. I wasn't looking for money. I wasn't looking for a sponsorship. I didn't even have a place to put an oven, you know? So I wasn't like they were going to send me an oven. I was like, let me really find out about it. So once I actually got in there and I started working on the oven itself, I was able to say, hey, you know what? This is really good. Um, this is who you're competing against. This is what your competition offers. And I see maybe, you know, they're, you know, that you're not apples to apples. You need to fill the gap a little more, or, you know, you got a, a great burner in your oven. I think it needs to be this, you know, uh, taking those things to heart, all of a sudden they saw me more as a, a partner in what they were doing. And I love, I love that, you know, all of a sudden I get a phone call on my cell phone from the COO of a big corporation saying, hey, Leo, you know what, we were talking about this, uh, you know, the burner, and, um, you know, you mentioned a, a programming issue. Like, why is, why is the COO of this company even talking about the programming of a burner? So to me, that really appealed to me because it's, it's a hands-on approach of doing business the way that I do business. So when they finally said, Leo, you know what, we'd love you to be a part of our team. Come on as a, you know, as a contributor, as one of our chef panelists, and, uh, and really get in here. And then they offered me the position as brand ambassador where I was doing demonstrations and all that. So again, it was such a natural fit. All the relationships that I have, and I think this is really important for you to understand, I never went knocking on doors for money. You know, everybody that I deal with is either products that I use every day that I love and believe in, or are things that people are bringing me to my attention saying, hey, come and check this out. We know we can't buy you. All right. Come and check this out and you make your own decision and let us know what you think. So again, everybody that I rep, okay, um, or I talk about their products or I use their equipment, it's because I really use them every day. It's because I love them. I know the inside and outs about them. I know what makes them great. So again, those types of things, if you were to come to me and do a consulting and say, Leo, I use this type of flour, guess what? We're going to use your type of flour to make your dough. But as soon as you turn the question around on me and say, hey, Leo, 
what do you use? Man, guess what? I'm going to tell you exactly what I use. I'm going to tell you why I use it. And then I'm going to say, let's bake a pizza side by side, my dough against your dough, and you make the decision what you think is better. And right. again, it's an easy sale because it's something that I live and breathe every day, you know? Yeah. Same thing uh, with uh, Carmelina tomatoes. Um, Carmelina, I've been using those tomatoes. My grandmother and my mother use those tomatoes. I've been using those tomatoes forever. All of a sudden, you know, I'm uh, I'm competing and I'm uh, I'm using this uh, I'm using these tomatoes and uh, and somebody sees me and says, Hey, Leo, what are you you know I saw you using these tomatoes. Why do you like them? All of a sudden, I'm at Pizza Expo one year and I'm walking around. Actually, I was walking around the guys from Forno Bravo. They had asked me, Hey, you know, we've never been to Pizza Expo before. We'd love to get your take on these things. Would you walk us around the show and tell us about some of the things you like, you don't like? Here we are. We walk right in front of the uh, Carmelina tomato booth. The sales guy looks at me, and I'm giving a sales presentation. And the guys, the, the sales guy is just staying here like that, like, all right, you're doing a pretty good job. Keep going, you know. So I'm telling these guys about their tomatoes and why they're great. As soon as I walk away, you know, the, the, the sales guy says, hey, you got to give me one of your cards. And he put me in front of the owner. I get a call from Matt Maslowski, who's now a very close friend of mine as well. Here's another guy. Matt Maslowski back in the day used to play for the Chicago Bears. You know, and, uh, you know, he's very well known. He had a lot of other businesses and, uh, you know, at, at some point decided that, hey, I'm going to go to Italy and I'm going to grow some tomatoes. I'm going to put them in a, in a can and bring them to the States. So, again, here's another guy who had a passion for what he's doing, a passion for quality ingredients, and it fit my, my model. It fit what goes along with me. And, you know, when those guys, same thing. They did a beautiful press release. Leo Spazzeri, our new brand ambassador, one of our one of our chefs. You know, it's yeah. it's very humbling to see a big major corporation to come out and say we've chosen this guy to represent our brands. You know, on, on something that on a side that we're not doing. You know, they're all pastas and you know and and, uh, and passatas and marinara sauces. And all of a sudden, Leo, what can you do in the pizza world? What can you do with our product? We've seen some great stuff. How do, we, how do we take that message and bring it to the masses? And again, for me, it was so easy because it's something, again, I was doing every day. I was already making videos. I was already blogging. I was already doing all these other things, telling people, look, you know what? I make my sauce. People forget. This is another thing. I'm going to walk with for one second. So people will come up to me when I compete and they talk about my sauce. All right? This is the greatest thing you've ever seen. You're, when you see me next time, you're going to ask me to do it for a guarantee. They say, Leo, we want your pizza sauce recipe. What's your recipe? Can you give it to us? Yeah, hey, no problem. It's easy. You need a piece of pizza. No, you don't even need a piece of paper. I'm going to tell you what it is. I take my whole peeled tomatoes. I use a food mill. I never grind them with a machine. I use a food mill and hand crank them because I like a little bit of that pulp of the tomato. Right. I use really awesome tomatoes, and I use one ounce of sea salt per can. I stir it together, and that's my sauce. Oh, you don't use no oil? You don't use no basil? No, because I'm putting all that on the pizza afterwards. I'm putting it on before I put it in the oven. You taste my sauce, and I got guys come up telling me, Leo, I would drink this pizza sauce. What's in it? There's nothing in it. It's just tomatoes. Go get some vodka. Make a Bloody Mary out of it. You know, like you, you can do anything with it at that point, you know? So, again, that's my point to this whole thing. So how do I use it? How do I use those ingredients? I'm known as doing things very clean. I, don't, I like the, the ingredient itself to shine. So again, me having a premium brand like Carmelina behind me, which, yeah, there's a hundred different options for tomatoes. When you talk about San Marzano tomatoes, you know, yeah, you kind of group and the group gets a little bit smaller where you talk about DOPs and Campania and Vesuvius and, you know, all these things, why those tomatoes are special. And again, for me, maybe I'm not using the same brands and all as my other friends are doing, but I know that when people have my pizzas, they're always saying the same thing, man, your pizza is awesome. Why? Well, this is the reason, you know, so well, that's it. And then, I mean, it just sounds like basically all these kind of uh, ambassadorships or, you know, uh, liaisons and stuff like that just kind of happened organically. It's just, they did. And that's, doing that's what they were doing cool. and getting noticed by them. Yeah. And them coming back and saying, Hey, you know what? Um, can we send you some free product? I never even asked for product from anybody. You know, I would always go to, I mean, like locally, if I was in a pinch, you know, like I Greco sons over here, if I couldn't get it from there, run a restaurant depot or whatever, you know? So like, you know, locally I was already doing it on my own anyway. It just, you know, these brands and people noticed me and said, Hey, you know what? We'd like to give you some free uh, ingredients. Can we support you in any way? Like, man, I'm, I'm doing a competition. You know, I really don't need anything. All of a sudden these guys are like, wow, 
you're saying something totally different than other people are saying, you know? But again, when you build up a relationship more of like, look, I like you, let's date for a while, you know? We don't need to get married right away. So you don't need to write me a check, you know? Right. But after we date for a while, we like each other. Yeah, let's figure it out, you know? Let's get married, you know? So I was really careful, you know, uh, you know, who I got married to. Let's just put it that way. Well, so, I also you know, see, yeah, I also see like, um, like research and development, those specialists at Little Lady Foods, Inc., now, is this something, another one of those um, kind of brand ambassadors, um, they, they like what you did as far as like dough, um, uh, just recipes or just so, development, I should say. So Little Lady Foods was like that. So that was like, um, that was a crazy one for me because um, that one was me totally stepping outside of my comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Me re- saying as a person, okay, saying that I'm this great dough guy, this great pizza guy. Now to be able to be called up, I got called by a headhunter and say, Hey, our, um, our, our research and development dough guy is retiring after 20 some years. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of people in this pool that we can pull from. We saw that you have some experience. Could you, uh, could you come and interview for this job? Now here I am. Here's a company that does all the major national frozen pizza brands saying, What's my job? My job is going to be to take a scope of work from one of these major national pizza brands and develop something from scratch that's going to be manufacturable, okay, high-speed manufacturing, and give a really great product that all of a sudden people say, you you never had a restaurant. Yeah, but I guarantee that at some point you ate a pizza that I made. And, you know, some of these contracts that we had, I mean, you're talking about, you know, eight, 10 million units annually, you know, in the frozen pizza section, again, without everything is confidential. I can't talk about my clients, but I guarantee that if you go down the frozen pizza aisle at whatever grocery store you're in across the United States, you pick out a pizza, more than likely you'll eat one or two that I've worked on, you know? And again, it was a pretty cool thing because I wasn't, I wasn't dealing in a small pizzeria where I was making, you know, uh, uh, 80, a hundred pounds of dough. My dough batches, you know, uh, uh, you know, production, you know, were like 1,500, 2,000 pounds of dough. And that dough would run, out, run down a line and we'd be out of dough in eight minutes, you know, wow. just to talk about how fast these lines ran. So, again, being able to take my knowledge and the, the actual chemistry part of dough, Little Lady Food saw that in me. And uh, it, it actually, um, just until recently, until about a month ago, um, I resigned from my position at Little Lady Foods. So I can start a, a brand new endeavor and something that's really big, a project that I'm working on here in Chicago. Okay. Now, and there's a, uh, also like, a, and I know I butcher this every time, sur la table. Sur la table. Sur la table. right first time. Sur la table. That's so sur la table is a, um, they're a, uh, a residential um, cooking store, like a cooking ware store. So pots, pans, you know, small wares, that sort of thing. Inside of the, uh, their, their stores nationally, they have a cooking school, right? Okay. Actually, this is another one. I, I, I go back to Tony Gemignani a lot. I mean, he's a really close friend of mine and everything. Um, Tony was doing classes for Sir Latava on the pizza side in California. And um, at some point, somebody must have connected the two dots that you got a pizza guy in California. You got another guy who's doing the same thing in Chicago. All of a sudden, I started getting calls. Hey, you want to come and do a pizza class in our store? Again, who am I? I'm not a teacher. I'm just a kid from Chicago making pizzas. You know, I'm not an instructor. So uh, I went in there, and they're jam-packing these classes. Everyone loves pizza classes. Everyone wants to learn how to make pizza. So, I mean, all of a sudden, I'm doing, you know, my first class, and there's got to be about 65 people in this thing. And here I am talking about dough chemistry and blowing over everybody's head. So, like – Talk about the first one. I mean, it was supposed to be a two-hour class. We were in there for about four and a half hours. People were looking at their watch like, I got to go, you know, walk my dog. I got to go all you know? So, uh, you know, after we had first one, that you know, they came back to me and said, Leo, you, do, you know a lot. You know, like, you got to bring this down to a level where people can understand you. And then I started doing um, pizza classes, bread classes, all different kinds of things for these guys. And, um, you know, it really got me started on that educational path giving back that knowledge, learning how to talk in front of people. And, uh, you know, through what I'm doing now with the website, all the videos and everything, you know, if I didn't have that little bit of, uh, you know, cutting your teeth in public speaking, if you will, and then how it relates to cooking and then being able to start a recipe from A to Z 
and at the end of the time be able to put something in everybody's mouth that they're going to love again it takes a little bit of magic and creativity and knowing how to do that and then the butterflies forget about the butterflies in your stomach that you're like oh my god i don't belong here well you know a couple of people have said all through the years like if you didn't belong here they wouldn't have called you you know and it always sits in your head you're like, all right i was good enough to get the call so let me try to give this a crack and give the best experience that I possibly can. So Sir Latop was really awesome for me through the years and even to this day. Um, you know, I don't do it as much anymore because my because of my schedule. Um, but, you know, usually maybe once a year I'll get in there and I'll do a nice uh, pizza class and, you know, they make an event out of it. So that's always, uh, you know, really cool to have your name in uh, the spotlight a little bit. But you, you kind of credit them a little bit with helping you um, kind of fine tune your your speaking abilities as far as judging your audience is yeah. mainly is what it is. Absolutely, and I you know I use I use the term suburban housewives a lot, you know, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I really credit the suburban housewives of the world uh, for really letting me perfect my craft and really do what I do because again somebody had to sit there and be the guinea pig and somebody had to sit there and listen to me. And, you know, being able to see the reactions of these people as I'm talking in that first class, I'll never forget, I got pictures of it. And just seeing these people like, oh, my God, when is this going to end? Like, because I was, I was speaking at a level and I didn't realize that I was speaking at a level that not everybody understood. So sure. it was taking that and being able to figure out, well, people need more pizza 101, not so much dough fermentation and, you know, uh, you know, all these high hydration, people didn't even know what hydration was, you know, what I was talking about. So how do I take the person who's never heard this before that says, I try to make pizza at my house and it's terrible to all of a sudden give them information that's at a certain level that they can totally understand what I'm giving them and then go home and then duplicate what I'm trying to do. So it took a while to understand that. But once I figured it out, it was now like everything I do, I can go through a cookbook go through a cookbook and say, is there any recipe in this book that I'm looking at that I can figure out how to tweak it and make it a wood fired oven recipe? And it's like all of a sudden, like, you know, am I making duck l'orange, you know, in a, in a wood fired oven? Not right now, but at some point, if somebody said, hey, I got a couple of ducks that were sitting around, I went hunting and I want to figure it out. Guess what? We're going to stick it in a wood fired oven. And we're going to figure this out. You know? So yeah. I guess that's the, the theme, how it all started. And that's, that's really it. Well, I mean, you said Pizza 101, you know, kind of bringing it down um, to the level of people who don't know, who aren't in the industry, who just want to have the knowledge just to do it for fun. Uh, what's on the future for Leo Spaziri there? So, um, a lot of people have been scratching their head for the past year. Um, I kind of did go underground um, with, you know, uh, social media stuff. Everyone's obviously seen what I've been doing on my website, the AskLeoPizza.com thing, and um, with Forno Bravo, I'm doing a lot of demos and providing a lot of content. So people have seen a lot from that, but nobody's really seen what's going on. And, you know, like I was saying about a month ago, I, you know, I was very fortunate that um, I'm in a point in my life where I was able to quit my day job, if you will, and uh, really jump into something. So along with uh, a partnership with uh, the school that I went to in Italy, the Scuola Italiana Pizzaioli, um, I've been offered an opportunity to open up a pizza school here in Chicago. So what I'm finding out though, after the last six months is that there's never been a pizza school in Chicago, a dedicated school. Um, a lot of guys have pizzerias where they do pizza classes in the back of them, that sort of thing. What I'm actually doing is building, uh, for a better term, I guess uh, we might be able to call this the Home Depot of pizza, where I'm trying to take every aspect of pizza and turn it around and give people the tools um, to learn about what we do. Besides the pizza school, I, I am going to be an official um, branch of the Scuola Italiana Pizzaioli in, um, in Italy. And um, this November, right after Thanksgiving, I'm actually going back to Italy and um, I'm going to be allowed to take the master instructor courses. So uh, what I'm hearing is, you know, there's very few uh, people at that level in the world. Um, a lot of people that know what I'm doing have actually like complimented me and saying, you know, Leo, in what you do, um, this is almost like you getting your doctorate. This is the highest point in the business that you can go. Um, and it's, you know, at 42 years, I'm 42 years old to be able to say that at your age that you've done this. Um, you know, again, there's not that many people that have done this. So, you know, again, I, again, my talk about, you know, Tony Gemignani, he was the first. 
if it wasn't him for pioneering these things, you know, I would have never even been able to kind of have the head to, you know, kind of understand, you know, where the industry was going. And uh, I'm very blessed and very, very humble at having these kind of opportunities. So um, in, uh, in November, we're in construction right now. Um, we'll, have, uh, we'll have the building complete. I'll have uh, a full uh, pizza school here where we're going to be teaching and certifying pizza makers in the five major styles of Italian pizza. Plus, I'll also be doing classes on the American styles as well. Um, with that, um, we talked about my relationship with uh, Sir Latab. Um, I actually uh, made very good friends with the coordinator of the culinary program for Sir Latab, and uh, she works for me now. So what we're going to be doing is um, creating um, a high-end cooking program here, 30-day class schedule rotations. So, you know, again, the suburban housewives of the world, the date nights, the wine pairings. You can come by my school and, uh, and take a class and learn how to cook a, cook a menu, cook an ingredient, cook uh, whatever, you know, whatever the theme is for that night. And every day is going to be something different. You'll actually be able to go on the website, sign up for a class, come in, and we're going to do demonstration style where I've got seating for up to 50 people in here or hands-on where you can actually take a course and we'll teach you how to put together a menu and make that dish. Um, inside also over here with part of my, uh, my school, um, I'm building a state-of-the-art dough room. So I'll have every major type of mixer on the floor. The four major styles of mixer will be here in an actual climate-controlled, uh, ambient temperature and humidity-controlled dough room. Um, so, you know, using that as an example, when I want to do a, a Neapolitan pizza certification, I'll actually able, be able to do that dough in a controlled environment that's set to the actual ambient conditions of Naples, Italy. You know, so when people you know, know that that dough has never gone into a walk-in cooler and, you know, that dough is going to sit ambiently until it gets used, again, to be able to say now that dough was created in the perfect conditions um, with the perfect mixer for that, um, using a gamut of different ingredients from all over the world to make different things, you know, all of a sudden, all my friends that are out there saying, man, I wish I could learn how to do this. Now I've got a home for them to come and say, here, let's go into my dough room and actually use the same machines that they're using in Italy or in that Neapolitan, uh, you know, bit. Let's actually do this dough by hand. And I'm going to show you on my madia, which is uh, my, my great grandfather's. I got a madia, the wooden dough box you mix the dough in. Mm -hmm. Mine's 60 years old. It's, it's a family heirloom of mine that you want to mix dough? Sure, I'm going to show you how to take 50 pounds of flour and make 100, 120 pounds of dough with it by hand, you know? Um, that being said as well, um, I can't bake every single style in only one type of oven. So my school will have nine different ovens in here that will fire from electric ovens to gas ovens, you know, that are deck ovens to wood fired ovens in an American style to wood fired ovens where you have a deck that spins and lifts up to the dome to Neapolitan ovens to residential ovens that we can pull outside and actually do pizza classes outdoors. And, you know, um, we're just now getting into the mobile business. So I've actually got a 12 foot trailer with a 4,000 pound uh, oven on it on a double axle. So we're going to be playing around with that now. So again, this really is Leo taking every bit of knowledge, somebody cracking my head open and letting it all just spew out. And if you want to learn, if somebody, your neighbor wants to learn, it doesn't matter if it's at your house or if you want to open up a pizzeria, now you've got a place that you can come to safe and secure, use any piece of equipment. And then, you know, I'm building a showroom too. So I'd like to be able to say, hey, you like this piece of equipment? I've got, a rep, I've got a representative that I can hook you up with. So you give this guy a call and he'll actually be able to sell you the piece of equipment that you learned on here at the school if you really love it that much, you know? So there's so much cool things that happen. And there's one more piece. I, I always forget this piece. <laughs> so what I wanted to do, I get a lot of calls to do a lot of different demonstrations, you know? Um, I've been blessed that, you know, I've got – fans, I guess we call them, people that actually show up to hear me cook or talk and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I really struggle when I have uh, high volume. So people calling me up and say, hey, can you cook for 300 people today? Well, no, I can't because I don't have a restaurant. I can't pull it off. I can't do that kind of volume. So what I'm actually putting together is a big production kitchen as well. So inside here, I'll have a full working kitchen like a restaurant 
10 burner stoves, grills, fryers, convection ovens, prep tables, slicers, anything you could possibly need. And now, you know, for example, you got, you're a mobile guy, you need to make a thousand dough balls. Guess what? You know, you don't have that kind of equipment. Sure. Let's work on an agreement like a co-op. All right. Um, giving back to, again, to people who are doing the same thing I do that don't have the, you know, don't have the equipment to do what I do. Come in, use my stuff, co-op style, bring your ingredients in. You want to use my production kitchen? Go ahead. The, the equipment is available to you. Just clean up when you're done, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, I think this is, again, me saying I really want to give back to the industry and I can't do it any better way than this. This is every bit of way I could think of doing giving back is, is all under one roof. So when you come to Chicago, um, we're located in Lyle, Illinois, which is right smack dab in between both major airports. Uh, there's a lot of entertainment district right, real close. There's hotels. There's everything. So we really tried to set this up so it would be as painful as possible for anybody looking to fly in from all over the world and say, hey, we want, to, we want some of that Leo knowledge. You know, what has Leo done? Can you show us some of these things? You might not want to take a five-day certification course and get certified as a pizza maker. You might have a restaurant and say, hey, I got three brand new pizza guys that I want to train up. Can I send them to you? And then, Leo, these are the style of pizza that we do. I want you to handle the consistency for me, and they can do it in my house, you know? And then I'll send them back to you. And now, all of a sudden, you got guys that are trained the professional way by professionals on professional equipment that now can do what you do. In the same respect, too, how many people that we have that I, I deal with all the time, I get phone calls and say, Leo, I'm an accountant, and my true passion is cooking. And I'd love to be able to take this, my, my big green egg in my backyard that I'm making pizzas on. And I'd love to now, people say I make a really good pizza. I'd love to be able to open my first restaurant. Fantastic. You know what? When you come to me, even if you don't have the restaurant, even if you say I want a new career, now I'll be able to give back to the industry. All my friends are all crying that we've got no help anymore. There's no labor anymore. The, the, the pool has really gotten shallow. So all of a sudden now, are these kids who are coming to me for education, is it really easy to turn back to you and say, hey, I'm going to offer you job placement. Now, where were you at the United States? I can turn around and say, go see this guy, and he's got a job open for you right now, where now you're building a career in an actual craft, like a bricklayer, you know, like, a, you know, like anybody doing a skilled trade, you're going to be on the cusp of now learning some big stuff. What you do with it when you leave is up to you. But if you truly have the passion, everybody tells me they got passion when they come in the door. If you truly have the passion you say you do, you're going to blow up because I'm going to give you the groundwork to build up, you know? So that's a really cool thing. And again, this is what's going on. Uh, we hope that uh, we're going to have our first class in uh, December is what we're shooting for. November will be built out. And, uh, you know, again, I, I would love to have, you know, everybody on your team come through. And, uh, you know, it's not for nothing else just to come and eat some pizzas, drink some wine or some beers and, and really have a good time and really celebrate what we built. Well, you, you know the pizza team, so you might regret that uh, invitation, man. Uh, I love it. Anytime I can have Gino and, uh, you know, if I could get LaMarco over here, you know, it's even better, you know, and uh, all these guys have been great. And again, talking about supporting the industry, you guys have done such a great job with, uh, with the U.S. pizza team and with the magazine, everything you've created to support us. Again, I say us because we are all brothers and sisters at the end of the day. And I really, I really believe that you guys are doing a service to, to, to everybody. Well, and we definitely appreciate that, man. And I wanted to extend the same uh, feelings to you as well as far as, like, all I'm hearing now is, hey, Brian, do I, I can't find good staffers. I, I'm, I just had a GM quit making 75 k a year. What's the problem? I got right. this guy who wants to make $15 an hour running a cash, cash register. You can't do it. So, like you said, refilling that pool is what we need. So, um, yep. that's great. Does this place have a name yet? So the name of the, the name of the school is the North American Pizza and Culinary Academy. And um, through, a, um, through an actual agreement um, with the Scuola Italiana Pizzaioli, we will have our pizza program that will be run under the, the Italian brand um, with the same curriculum. Just like you fly into Italy to take these courses and to get certified in Italy, um, the reason for me going to Italy to get my instructor certification is so that I can give that same exact experience just like you would get it in Italy. Um, we're working on the same equipment that you would have in Italy, um, not maybe the same brands, 
But uh, again, the same types of equipment. We're giving people again that experience again of not knowing a boundary. If you want to learn wood fired cooking, I'm going to teach it to you. If you want to learn how to make a Roman style pizza in a deck oven, I'm going to teach it to you. So that that being said, this is what we're trying to do. That's, I mean, that's that's all great. So you you said you're leaving uh, for that late November. Uh, yeah, right, right around the, right around Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving time is what I'm hearing. Yeah, right around Thanksgiving. So it all kind of plays in. If I hopefully I pass because if not, I mean, uh, I won't be, <laughs> I won't be teaching classes. We have all the Italians here. How long will that take? Do you think before you're back? Um, I'll probably be there a couple of weeks. But you know, the thing, important thing to remember is that you know, since there, all, since then, over the past ten years, I've constantly been going back, and I've constantly mm-hmm. been refining my skills and getting these actual certifications. Again, we call out, you know, being a master, you know, it's like, well, who made you a master? You just using it to put, you know, for publicity or do you really have the skill set to, to call yourself that? So, you know, when, when we talk about that term, I don't use it lightly. You know, it's, it's something of pride that, you know, I really worked very hard for. And again, these are all the pieces that when I give you a bit of knowledge, it's me giving you something that goes back, you know, three, 400 years. You know, and it's a, again, it's something of pride. And again, for, for, for you wanting to know, I'll be able to do it. That sounds great. And I mean, I think every, I was going to ask you more questions when you were describing it, but you've got that pitch down, man. You, know, you <laughs> answered every single question as I was trying to think of them. So yeah, I appreciate all the help on, on all this, man. And you know, I'm going to be uh, calling you a lot. I like well, it was nice chatting with you, Brian. And if you need anything else, please just give me a call. I will, man. Thanks so much, Leo. You have a good day, buddy. Bye. Bye.